So you muted yourself. Okay, sorry. Uh, my computer's doing weird things today. I accidentally did that. I hope you can hear me now. Okay, so 1.1.3, the DNA of different species only differ. Now, the components of the nucleotides will always be um, a nitrogenous base, um, a sugar, and a phosphate. Okay, uh, just for the afternoon class, guys, uh, just the other class, we couldn't have a meeting this morning. So that's why I invited them to the afternoon class. Uh, usually they'll have their class in the morning. Now, people, sequence of the nucleotides will be different. Okay, the sequence of the nucleotides will be different uh, because that determines the genes, which determines the proteins that a, an organism consists out of. So for B, B is correct. Okay. Let us just go through the other options just to see why the other ones are not correct. Type of bond between the nitrogenous bases is always a, a hydrogen bond. And type of sugar that it contains will always be a deoxyribose sugar. So 1.1.3 was B. Let's go to 1.1.4. One strand of DNA molecules has 60 adenine. Okay, and there's 20 thymine molecules. Now, the moment they give you both of those, it's, it's saying to you something, uh, they're, they're trying to trick you there. So, so read it very carefully. How many adenine molecules are present in the double-stranded molecule? Okay, so now remember that thymine connects to adenine. Thymine will always connect to adenine. So thymine connects to adenine. And so if I've got one strand of, of DNA and it's got 60 thymines, on the other side, it needs to be 60 adenines. And on this side, if there's 20 um, uh, thymines on that side, there needs to be then 20, uh, um, sorry, 20, if there's up, uh, let me just, sorry, I'm just going to erase that because I'm, I almost made a mistake now. Okay, so let's just recap that again. There's two strings of DNA, one, two. And on this side, I've got 60 adenines. Them right now, 60 adenines. And so on this string, I've got to have 60 thymines connected to the 60 adenines. And then on the, uh, on the same string, I've got 20 thymines and thymine connects to adenine. So on this side, I've got to have 20 adenines. So if you take 60 plus, there's your adenine. They're asking you how many adenines are there in total. Please switch off your device. I have to go in and switch you guys off. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Now, people, so 60 plus 20 gives you 80 in total. They're asking how many adenine molecules are present in the double-stranded DNA? That will be 80. So the answer is C, 80. So 80 adenine molecules in total. Okay, then 1.1.5, the diagram below shows the effect of three different antibiotics on a single strain of bacterium growing on agar in a petri dish. The three circles indicate the distance of which the antibiotic has spread. Okay, um, now the reason why we're asking this, this is not about DNA, but you can answer it already. So that's why I included the question because you had similar questions in grade 11. But this question can be asked as an evolution question at the end of the year 
because it, it has to do with natural selection. And so that's why we can ask this question already because you have done bacteria already last year. And because you have done bacteria and resistance and um, last year already, that is why we are able to answer this question already. And so that's why I included it for you to be able to, so that you can do it. So let's talk about it. Let's take a look, which one is more effective? So the one that's most effective is the one that kills the most amount of bacteria and thus has the least amount of bacteria that we can see. So in this case, C has the least amount and I'm just eyeballing it quickly here. Then it's X and then it's Y. So the sequence will be Z, X and Y. So the answer for this one will be A, Z, X and then Y. Okay, then people, um, let's go to 2.1.1 uh, point. Let me just double check on which one you had to do. Is there any more from question 1.1? 1 .1? It said 1.1.7 as well. I wonder why I included that one, but let's take a look. 1.1.7, probably also a, an evolution question, but you've done evolution in grade. 10 as well, so you should be able to, to do it as well. So let's take a look at 1.1.7. In the most stable freshwater environment, populations of Daphnia are, most, uh, are entirely, almost entirely female and reproduce asexually. However, males are observed in low oxygen environments or when food is scarce. Based on these observations, a researcher suggests that the start of an example that male Daphnia only develop in response to unfavorable environmental conditions. Okay, so what is he saying here? What is he saying here? Is, it, uh, is he giving a conclusion? Is he giving an hypothesis, a theory on aim? Ladies and gentlemen, the reason they're asking this question is because it's a scientific method question. They, they, they going over your, your knowledge of the scientific method and being able to know what is a conclusion, what is a theory, what is an aim, and what is an hypothesis. And in this case, 1.1.7 is B. It's an hypothesis. He hasn't done any physical research yet. He's just coming up with a prediction on what he thinks the results of such an experiment would be. So 1.1.7 is an hypothesis, which is a prediction on the results of an investigation. And so the answer is B. Let's go to question two, uh, 1.2, and we have to answer, sorry, uh, I just wanna see which questions we had to answer. We had to answer 1.2.1 and 1.2.2, and then 1.3.1. Okay, so let's take a look. No, wrong. wrong document, that's the memo. I will be posting you guys the memo, but we need to know why the answers are correct, and that's why we're discussing it. Okay, so 1.2.1 says chromosomes that carry the same set of genes. Okay, chromosomes that carry the same set of genes and the correct answer for that one is a homologous chromosome. Now you haven't done that yet, but it's gonna be a very important term when we get to genetics, which we already discussed. We, we mentioned the father of genetics so far, uh, which was Mendel. Um, and we'll be doing that in more detail later. Okay, two or more alternative forms of a gene at the same locus. Again, that's called an allele, allele. And we haven't done it yet, but when we get to genetics, which concerns DNA, we will be doing that in detail, an allele. Let's go to 1.3.1. Okay, produced the first X-ray pictures of DNA. Now we gotta be careful. We know that Watson and Crick, James Watson and Francis Crick took the X-ray pictures and 
they actually um, made the first models of what DNA should look like, uh, or that we think looks like the double helix. But who took the pictures? It was Rosalind Franklin. So for 1.3.1, the correct answer is B only because she took the actual pictures. She produced the, the X-ray pictures. That was Rosalind Franklin. Now, when we talk about those four people and the discovery of DNA, that's the typical question you're going to get. And normally for that, that whole lesson, that's about two marks. They normally don't ask more than two marks out of that section of work on the discovery of the DNA. And it's normally this question. Tepu, you've got a question. Yes, sir. do you think that um, Wilkins did it do everything? Did, uh, is, there, is there anything that it did by taking Franklin's picture to um, mm. Watson and Creek? Yes, I, I personally do. I personally do. Um, like, I think he, he should have asked permission. But that, you know, that's, like a moral, that's a moral question. And I think it, um, because, because Frank, uh, Rosalind Franklin took the picture, she actually had ownership of that picture. And in terms like, of being a research partner, before you so, show your research to anybody else outside of your, your study group, it, it, it would be more... It would have been nicer for him if he checked with Rosalind Franklin before. And what's so sad is that he, um, together with Watson and Creek, actually received the Nobel Prize. And unfortunately, Rosalind Franklin didn't. But she actually sacrificed her life to take that picture. I thought that when she gave um, Wilkins the picture, she, she didn't really care what um, Wilkins would do with it, isn't it? No, uh, she, she would. Uh, uh, what, what, what is the, situ the situation there? You've got to understand is that um, if you take a look at Wilkins, he was in charge of her. He was like the professor that was in charge of her research. So he was supposed to guide her to be able to do her research, not give her research to someone else to complete. Oh, and okay. that's what he technically did. Yes, thank you. Okay, very nice question. I, I love that story. I love the whole history behind that. Uh, it, 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 it's so much, actually, it, you can actually have made a movie out of this uh, or really a really good documentary out of that story, I think. Okay, now let's go on to the next question that you guys had to answer which was 3.1, 3.2, and 3.4. Okay, so all under question three. And of course, guys, you remember later you have this paper available right now. So as we go through the sections of work, there's gonna be more, uh, more and more of this whole paper that you're gonna be able to answer. Okay, so 3.1. Says to us, read the extract below. The recent Ebola outbreak, outbreak has international medical organizations on high alert. Hey, it just, just sounds like an outbreak, high medical alert. Doesn't this so, just sound like familiar to us now with Corona? The Ebola virus is deadly because it causes uncontrolled bleeding. The virus is only spread through direct contact with body fluids. When I, when I did this paper last year, I didn't even think about that Corona could happen to us. There is, however, concern as to whether the Ebola virus could mutate like, like Corona did now, thereby enabling it to be transmitted through the air. If this happens, the virus would spread more easily. That, that, doesn't that sound familiar as well with Corona? And we have the um, especially the South African variant that they say is more transmissible and easier to transmit from one person to another. The virus contains RNA only. And when RNA is copied, many mistakes, we call them mutations, many more mistakes are made than when DNA is copied. The Ebola virus therefore displays high mutation rates that generates lots of genetic variation. 
Now I've got a scene, uh, now I'll, immediately I've got questions coming up in my head about Corona. Um, and I wonder about the genetic material within Corona, whether it's, it's only got DNA or has it only got RNA or ha does it have both? We don't, uh, I don't know, but it's certainly a, a question that you can ask. Okay, so 3.1.1. State why viruses that contain only RNA shows more genetic variation than viruses containing DNA. Okay, this is very interesting because if you take a look at RNA, RNA is a single string. And when a single string is being copied, or it's easy to adjust a single string, when, when you have DNA, what happens is you have a double string. And because you have a double string, and there's a complementary pairing on the double string, it's a lot more difficult to actually initiate mutations because the two strings are regulating one another. They're double checking one another. There's always a, a complementary copy that makes sure that when you are copying it, that, that because there's a complementary pairing happening, it's checking the copying process the whole time. Okay, and so that's why RNA mutates a lot easier than DNA, which is only a single string and not a double string. Use one example of the extract above to explain how mutations could increase the survival rate of the virus. Okay, that has to do with um, natural selection again. And what happens is when we have mutations, most of those mutations we discussed already said has no effect. It happens in the non-coding part of the DNA or RNA in this case. But, but if it happens on where the genes happen, genes are going to form proteins, okay? And the proteins can change. Now, most of the times those proteins are actually harmful to us then if they change. But sometimes, it's positive. Uh, it has a positive effect on the protein and it makes the organism more suitable for its environment or changes in the environment. And so that's why we then have those changes. Let's say, before we answer Tepo's question, let's just take a look at how they state it in the memo. I say to us, 3.1. Okay. So um, they said for 3.1.1, more mistakes are made in RNA than in DNA. We explain why. Because there's a double string in this complementary pairing. And if 3.1.2, a mutation would allow the virus to be transmitted through the air, and this would allow the virus to spread more easily. So they just wanted from the passage to say, the passage said, the, the mutation allowed for the virus to be transmitted through the air, and if it goes through the air, the virus would be spread more easily. Now, be careful of what I did now. I looked at all the previous knowledge I had, and I, uh, I gave it to you why there would be beneficial mutations. And they are specifically, use one example from the extract. What did I not do? I didn't use an example from the extract. Okay, Tepu, what is your uh, what is your question? You can please explain number one. I don't understand what it means. Okay, state why viruses that contain only RNA show more genetic variation than viruses that contain DNA. According to the memo, uh, they say more mistakes are made when RNA is copied, when RNA is replicated, than when DNA is replicated. Now, what happens with RNA, it's a single string. And so when you copy a single string, there's not a second string that is going to regulate or that is going to double check whether the copying is happening correctly. But now remember, when we talk about DNA, DNA is a double string, a complementary double string. So there's always a second string that double checks the copying process. And so that's why with RNA, we would find more mutations happening than with DNA because there's no second string to check the copying process happening. Okay, let's go on to 3.2. 
The questions below are based on no nucleic acids. Tabulate three structural differences between DNA and RNA. Okay, DNA, double string. RNA, single string. DNA, shorter. RNA, uh, sorry, DNA longer. RNA will be not much shorter. DNA also contains a deoxyribose sugar. RNA only contains a ribose sugar. Okay, Tepo, you have another question. Yes, sir. what if you stated that um, I think the, uh, DNA cannot move out of, out of the nucleus while the RNA can move yes, um, out of the nucleus? Correct, yes. Oh, okay. Yes, but now remember when, when, we, when we answer that question now, that's not a structural question. That's not a structural difference. That is a difference the, where it's found. It's a location difference. RNA is found inside the nucleus and outside the nucleus. DNA is only found inside the nucleus, but is that a structural difference? No, it's not. It's a location, it's a difference of where they are found, the location. So I want to know a structural difference. And so that's why we only say length of the molecule. We say double helix or single strand, a double strand or a, sing a, a single strand. And we say, um, in terms of the structure, the sugar that's being used, is a, a deoxyribose sugar or is it a ribose sugar? Important in terms of that question, and I'm going to show you now the um, important as well. Remember, you get one mark. I want you to see here. You get one mark for actually drawing the table. So even if you gave me no answers and you just wrote DNA and RNA at the top and you had a table, you will get a mark. Please don't forget that. When I ask you to tabulate, that's not a mark you want to lose. And it must be a proper table, not just a line through the middle of your page, please. Okay. Um, let's just take a look if there's any more changes we didn't pick up. Oh, yes. One more thing. Thymine. And we haven't discussed that in detail because we haven't done protein synthesis or RNA yet. In DNA, we have thymine, but in RNA, we have got uracil. So in, in RNA, uracil replaces thymine. Okay. Sepu, yes, you have another question? How come that um, DNA is, more, is, is longer than RNA? Okay. Uh, the simple, uh, they, they, uh, firstly, when you have a double strand, you can make a longer molecule because it's longer because you have a double strand that can wind up onto one another. So it's easier to make a longer molecule uh, uh, because it's stronger to have that double helix. That's the first thing. And then in the function of it, um, if RNA was longer, it wouldn't be able to go, and then it would be like DNA, it wouldn't be able to go in and out of the nucleus. And that's one of these functions for RNA is to go in and out of the nucleus to carry the message from the DNA to the, uh, to the ribosome. And so that's why um, a bigger molecule wouldn't work. We need a shorter molecule to be able to do that. Does that mean that um, RNA is shorter than DNA? I mean, it's RNA than is DNA. a lot shorter than DNA. A lot and shorter. And is it thinner than DNA? Is it thinner? Uh, uh, yes, it would be thinner because remember, it's a single strand instead of being a double strand. Oh, okay. Okay. Now, let's go on to the next question that we had to answer. Um, okay, that was a DNA profiling, whatever, and I've asked you that. Then I think it was 3.4. Let me just double check. 3.1, 3.2, and 3.4. But you had to answer 3.4.1 and 3.4.6 only. Okay, so let's take a look. Did we miss anything? No. Okay. DNA profile. Um, okay. Um, guys, I'm not going to, don't worry about 3.2.2 and 3.2.3 yet. We'll get to DNA profiling at a later stage. Let's go to 3.4.1 and 3.4.6. An investigation was done by grade 12 learners to determine which chickens grow faster, 
chickens that are selectively bred for laying eggs or chickens that are selectively bred for meat production. Okay, so this is an investigative question. Just the way it's going, it says to us it's an investigation. And let's go and see what they're going to ask us now. The following steps were carried out. The learners brought 30 one day old chickens from com a commercial supplier. 15 of the chickens have been selectively bred for laying eggs, and 15 have been selectively bred for meat. So I either want a chicken that lays a lot of eggs or a chicken that's going to give me a nice, uh, a lot of meat when I'm buying my KFC. All the chickens were kept under the same environmental conditions. This included some. And that means they, this is going to be a reliable investigation um, uh, and it's going to be a valid investigation because it's reliable. Why? Because I took a lot of specimens, 15 and 15, and got an average and it's going to be a valid investigation. Why? Because they were kept under the same environmental conditions. This included being fed the same feed made mostly from cereals and grains and protein sources. And the chickens were weighed regularly for a period of 45 days. And I show the results. And if you take a look at the weight of the chicken, you can see chickens that are selectively bred for meat. They picked up a lot of weight very quickly. But those that were selected to lay eggs, they of course, we don't worry about whether they're big chickens. They just need to lay eggs. And so you can see that they have they didn't grow as quickly. Okay, let me say formulate an hypothesis for this investigation. Okay, so uh, if chickens are selectively bred for meat production, they would increase their weight a lot more than chickens who are bred for egg laying, for example. But you can also almost turn that around and it can remember your, your hypothesis. Just remember that your hypothesis doesn't need to be correct in terms of the investigation. It just needs to have, because it's only a prediction before I start the investigation. And I'm even going to prove my hypothesis correct or prove my hypothesis incorrect. And so that's not really going to matter as long as I have both variables that we are mentioning inside my hypothesis. So what are my variables? The weight of the chickens and whether the chickens were bred for um, meat production or whether they were bred for egg laying. And 3.4.6, write a suitable conclusion for the investigation based on the results of the graph. And so that's going to sound similar to your hypothesis, but the only difference is this time, is now I know that chickens that are selectively bred for meat production will increase their weight a lot more than chickens that were selectively bred for egg laying. Okay, and that is the sections of the paper that you have to complete. Tomorrow we will be concerning about RNA and hopefully protein production. Uh, tomorrow we'll have two lessons again, hopefully one during the day and then one in the afternoon. And again, I will post this recording later today onto the Google Classroom. Are there any questions still that you guys want to ask? I see there's nothing in the chat box at the moment. So regarding 3.4 point. 3.4 point? Okay. And the investigator, point one. 3.4 point one. Let's go back to 3.4 point one. I'm going to go to the memo and show you. For that stage. Mm -hmm. What was your answer? Okay, guys, I see that my internet connection is giving some trouble. Okay. Um, just repeat your, uh, your answer you gave for 3.4.1. I said chickens that are bred for meat production grow faster than chickens that are bred for laying eggs. But that, I'm saying, I, like, like, I hear you talking about the weight. Yeah, um, but the, if you say grow, that means the weight. Okay, so the growth indicates the weight. So you find there 
you've included both variables grow faster or uh, pick up weight a lot uh, quicker they have more weight or um, so anything that indicates their growth or the amount of growth that is fine and how come 3.4.3 is 400 percent okay let's take a look at the question because you didn't have to answer it but let's go and take a look at the question and then the answer okay so it it asks us calculate the percentage weight increase of the chickens that was selectively bred for between day eight and day 45 and show all calculations. So you've got to take day 45 and you've got a minus, you've got a minus day eight. So in this case, it's 2,500 minus 500 and then divided by 500 because it's a percentage increase and then times 100. So let's take a look at the formula if they did the same. So 2,500, that's the last day, minus day eight, minus 500, divide, uh, and you get an, a, a total for that, M divided by the 500 because it's a percentage increase times 100 because it's a percentage, and they increase their weight by four times or 400%. Um, I think what you got it, um, if your formula is not the same as that one that you're seeing on the screen now, Chipo, I want you just to double check that the way you're using your calculator, especially with that 2,500 minus the 500. Take the 2,500 minus the 500, which is 2,000, okay? And equals first before you divide it by 500, because what sometimes would happen is that if I insert this into my calculator incorrectly, it's going to use, um, uh, they call it in maths, I'm not a maths teacher, but must, and then your calculation according to the calculator is going to be incorrect. So you need to take 2,500 minus 500 equals, get a total, take that total, divide it by 500, and times it by 100. And you'll see you're getting 400%. And it's a 400 times increase. If you think um, they now, if you take 200, uh, 2000, and you divide it by 500, that's four times. Times that by 100 to get an increase, that's 400%. Oh, so I see it, thanks. Okay. Okay, thank you guys. Uh, we, we actually discussed the whole paper and um, within the, the given time, and that's good. Tomorrow, RNA, um, hopefully some protein synthesis. Maybe um, if we don't get that done tomorrow. I guess afternoon lesson, right? I don't then see you tomorrow. Tomorrow, you've got your physical sciences lesson. So we'll discuss the next one on Wednesday, which then we'll have to cover RNA and protein synthesis. And for tomorrow, tomorrow's lesson in the morning will be RNA and hopefully at least some protein synthesis. Thank you very much. See you guys either for some of you tomorrow, for some of you on Wednesday. Ruan, you've got a question? Yes, sir. So, so one sort of ask, um, do you think that we should write notes on the work we did every, no. so like every, every five cents lesson? No. Evenings? I don't think that you should write notes. I don't think you are a copying machine. And um, I'm, 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 I know that sounds very rude, but sometimes I feel that way because, I, no, always I feel that way because I, I've seen from previous experience um, that learners who write notes actually write the notes without thinking. Now you, you are different. Uh, you are now you're going to try and summarize the notes and you're going to try and put it into uh, some type of your own notes. You can and maybe even mind maps and and and. But most learners writing notes actually write the notes without any function from the cerebrum whatsoever. So there's no, nothing from the, the, the thinking part of your brain that actually responds. Most learners 
write notes using their cerebellum, their small brain, and it's instinctive, and they don't actually think about what they are writing. So I don't believe in writing notes. Um, I will give you enough exercises to do so that you can practice your brain. And also, um, if you want to, if there's something that you want to copy, copy diagrams, copy schematics, don't copy notes. Okay. But so like, what if you do like active recall at the end of each lesson so that you can try to return for notes? That, that, is, that is perfect, that is perfect. That's a good way to study it. And you're going and you're thinking about it as you go through it. But uh, the normal copying, don't, don't do that, okay? Don't just so, copy so, word for so, word. Yeah. So would you say that it should be a daily practice then? Hmm. So it's a good practice to make a summary of the work afterwards. Guys, if, if the time runs out now, okay, uh, good luck, okay. Um, I'm mm. not gonna restart the lesson, okay. I didn't hear what you said, so could you repeat? Uh, okay, so it's good to have a summary if you want to make your own summary, but don't go and copy word for word. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, well, good luck, guys. I see you have one question in the chat. Let's check. Maybe we can answer that. Okay, 3.4.6. So I'm going to move it up very quickly. There we go. 